So the title's a nod to David Bowie, and we're going to talk a little bit about our experiences uh, both locally and nationally with telehealth around critical care medicine. Just by show of hands, the Emory people, um, well, let, let's include everybody. How many people here work in an ICU that is recipient of some kind of EICU or telehealth services? Show of hands. Right, now, all those who are not from Emory in our system, put your hands down. Okay? All right. So we, it's a relatively small number. We'll try to share with you a little bit of what our experiences have been, how they resonate with the national experiences, and where we think uh, we're going with telehealth and critical care. Next slide. So neither Cheryl nor I have financial interests in this talk. Uh, my role as editor-in-chief of critical care medicine and the McDonald Foundation generates money that goes to Emory. Uh, for purposes of this talk, uh, all of our opinions are personal. They don't represent those of Emory, CMS, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, or any other organization or publication. Next. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Emory experience, the national experience, what we've learned, and, and what remains uncertain. Next. You want to tell them what we do? So this is a picture of the Emory EICU. Oops. Maybe I shouldn't hold this. Yeah, you probably shouldn't. Wrong way. Wrong Sorry, way. guys. There you go. <laughs> The technology gets her. I know. We call it... That's very funny. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we call it the core, which is a clinical operations room. And this is what it looks like on any given day when we're working. We have nurses and physicians. Physicians are nights, weekends, and holidays. Nurses are 24-7. And we have computers that have six screens that we work from. We started the program in 2013, and we use an industry standard... EICU platform, we monitor 16 locations in five hospitals and 136 beds. So since we began monitoring folks, we've, we've had about 57,000 ICU days. Uh, we've actually crossed 18,000 unique patients. Right. About two out of three of the patients that we monitor are federal beneficiaries. That'll become important as we get to some of the later slides. Uh, and the federal beneficiaries, being older and a little sicker, take up a little bit of a disproportionate amount of clinician time. So what uh, has been found both in our environment and in others are, are three things that we'll talk a little bit about. I'm going to let Cheryl walk you through the next set of slides. Yeah, if you look up research in EICU and the particular data elements they're looking at, this is primarily what you'll see. There are, in most of the studies, they find a decrease in mortality rates, a decrease in the length of stay, and an increase in adherence to best practices such as a VTE. We, they also find increases in Apache scores, which means people seem to be able to take care of sicker patients because they have care throughout the 24-hour period of time rather than having intensivists at the bedside in the daytime and calling people at night, waking them up, asking for what you need. So this data is from the first hospital we started monitoring, which is a community hospital. And as you can see, since I don't know how to do the pointer, ah, September of 13, their Apache scores indeed have gone up and they've maintained. This is, all of this data is from the same hospital because they were the first one we started. We have longer periods that we were able to track their information. This is length of stay, and it's an actual over-predicted ratio. So the blue and sort of red-purple lines are for the hospital information, and the green and blue lines are for the ICU information. So since we started, they have consistently decreased the length of stay, and that has maintained. And you'll see there was a big change when we started the physician coverage. We started with nurses first, and then we added physicians. There was a little dip when the nurses came, but primarily with the physicians at night monitoring the patients and making sure that they're teed up to go out the next day, it has impacted our length of stay. You'll see the same thing on the mortality rates. Right here you saw, you see, excuse me, that even with implementing the nurse monitoring, we saw a significant drop in the, in the mortality rates. 
because someone was watching and notifying the bedside when they see something going on and saying, hey, I don't know if you're aware of this, please go check on this patient. So this is a big take home lesson. Everyone in this room is a committed critical care professional and no one can imagine that you miss stuff when you're sitting in the ICU on duty taking care of patients. Having a second pair of eyes, looking at the data, looking at trends in the data that you might not appreciate because you're going from bed to bed to bed and worrying about doing things actually directly for the patients versus looking at the data, you find stuff. When you find stuff and you fix it then and there, that's what happens to your mortality ratios. And it doesn't matter whether you are a small community hospital, big university hospital, anything in between, this is a fairly standard observation. So with the VTE prophylaxis, it's also one of the measures that we look at. The nurses in my area actually go through every patient we monitor once a shift and check for VTE prophylaxis. And then when the physicians started around here, and they really had a much bigger impact on this than we did, because they can actually Write put the, the orders. orders in, make sure people are following the protocol. So this is a second big message from telehealth around ICU. Monitoring and keeping an eye for deviations is important, but being able, having physicians on site who are able to actually write orders and make sure that there is compliance with standards that have been set for care makes a difference as well. So this is about resource, resources conserved by EICU intervention. And this is based on the actual versus predicted length of stays and they're all based on Apache risk stratification. So Apache gives us an actual, predict, uh, an actual outcome, and then they give us a predicted outcome, how long the patient should be in the hospital. And you'll see that we have a wide divergence here. And this is an overall number. This is for the individual hospitals that we monitor. So since inception, we probably saved about 10,000 ICU days. But ICU days, in our view, is not really what's important. That's what's important. And this is also based on the Apache data. It's predicted, the predicted mortality outcomes. So it's predicted lives that we have saved during the period we've been there. And again, this is an overall number and these are the individual hospitals. It averages out to probably one patient per day. The lives saved isn't necessarily in the ICU, but by getting the patient through the ICU more safely, you get into significant downstream effects We'll talk about that again when we talk about the aggregate cost and benefit of EICU. So I just want to, re we're not going to take up a lot of your time. I want to leave some time for questions, but there are a couple of studies that I wanted to bring to your attention. This is an old one now. It's published in 2011 in JAMA by Craig Lilly, and this basically described their inception as they went up with EICU. Uh, why don't you go to the next slide? Okay. And basically what they did is they said, what did things look like pre-intervention? What happened after the tele-ICU intervention? And if you think about your own unit where you don't have EICU oversight, you have bedside monitor alarms, you have your daily goal sheets. If something happens in the middle of the night, somebody gets on the phone, the house officer comes and looks, calls an attending, you know, gets him or her out of bed, so forth and so on, you know, this is what's going on. With the tele-ICU intervention, you supplement the bedside monitor alarms, and it's always supplementation with trending alerts, lab value alerts, re review of the responses to alerts, rounding in the EICU with the doctor and the nurse talking to one another because there's always an EICU doc and they're speaking. In addition to the daily goal sheet, we pick up non-adherence and we fix it. There's real-time auditing and we provide feedback to our various sites at intervals uh, in the form of audits. And perhaps most importantly, there is somebody awake 24-7 who's looking at the patient. It's no telephone, wake him up, would you please try to look at this. The data are presented to professionals who were there for the sole purpose of keeping an eye on those patients. 
as a second level of care and promoting interactions based on the data with all members of the team and assessing response. And the, for those who aren't aware, we actually have the program that we use gives us trends in information that come directly from the monitors and from the EMR. So we have access to a lot of different trending analytics that people in the unit don't necessarily have. So these were the data that, uh, that Craig published. And I call your attention to the fact, uh, if, if you simply look at the mortality rates up there on the upper right, where you see the tele-ICU effect estimates and the p-value, you can see that there's a significant reduction of the hospital mortality uh, to 40% of baseline, significant reduction in the ICU mortality to 37% of baseline, and you see those p-values. You say, how is that possible? Simply by providing a second level of care, you can cut lengths of stay beyond half, you can cut mortality beyond half. But those are what the data show. Nobody really wanted to believe it. Next. Uh, again, data showing what happens when you keep track of uh, uh, standard practices. The second line down on prophylaxis, it says deep venous thrombosis. And what you'll find there in the tele-ICU group, you'll see they got up to 99.5% compliance. That's very close to where we got to, 98, 99% compliance. Like us, they started low, in their case, at about 85%. Clients. Those small changes add up. They add up to fulfilling standards of care, whether it be low tidal volume ventilation, uh, conservative transfusion practices, whatever it happens to be, and it all falls through to bottom lines measured in length of stay and survival. Next. I want to talk a little bit about money. EICU is not cheap. In round numbers, in round numbers, it's about $40,000 per bed per year. I share that number with you just so you have an idea what it costs. Um, it's, you know, you can think of it as $100, $120 a day, somewhere in the range of four and a quarter an hour. The, the, sort of the way the numbers work out. We looked at our own environment. We looked, concentrated on the federal beneficiaries and this is what hap has happened over time. This is now, in our data, about two years, two and a half years of data as we, as we turn the various systems on. And what you'll see is that in some hospitals, we have a significant decrease in costs. One, we have a little bit of an increase, but what you see is this convergence. And what that convergence is telling you is that we're getting closer and closer to standard care. Now, your eyes will probably tell you that the big mass of data suggests that from where we started to where we were in September of 15, we are actually taking costs out of the system. We want to believe that. We want you to believe that. But we know that you're not going to believe it if we simply say, gee, we're successful. We made costs go down. What you might not know is that at the inception of the EICU, this was brought up as part of an award from the federal government, uh, a CMS Healthcare Innovation Award. And when you, they're very nice and they give you the money and they say there, there are a couple of strings attached. One is that we have an external evaluator looking over our shoulder, doing comparisons of our performance with reference comparators of their choosing. We have no control over how they evaluate our costs and our cost reduction, our performance and our performance improvement. I can only share with you data that's been made public about the first year or so of operation. That's on the next slide. This is what's been publicly released, analysis of a couple of consecutive quarters of operation that was beginning about July 2015. The metric was total cost of federal beneficiaries for the hospitalization and extending 60 days post-discharge. We didn't have any control over this metric. They do. Okay? They say, we're going to look at total cost of care. They choose the comparators. It's a propensity matching thing. But it's based on their criteria about what they think is honest, not what we think is going to make us look good. Again, we have no control over, the, over this study. These are very early data. 
the savings are estimated somewhere in the twelve to $2,200 range per federal beneficiary who's touched. And again, because you know, there weren't many people at the time this analysis was done and reported, p-value is just trending. There's no statistical significance at point one. Now, what I can tell you is that analysis is ongoing. Additional quarters have been completed and reported to CMS, and we're not permitted to discuss the data at this time. And unlike Emory, CMS tracks these patients for six months post-discharge. They look at readmissions anywhere. They look at continued office visits, clinic visits, et cetera, for six months post-discharge. So we, we should have for you in about a year's time a significant amount of data and publication and so forth that actually represents external evaluation of the entire program. I can't make it any cleaner than that. Next. This uh, was published recently in Critical Care Medicine, uh, and it allows folks who are thinking about EICU and what does it mean in terms of value for my hospital to get some, their arms around calculations. I think everybody would agree that if EICU services were free, everybody would say, sure, why not? If I told you it was a million dollars a year per bed, you would say, uh, no, thank you. So somewhere in the middle, there's a price point that makes it valuable. This analysis, uh, again, not done by us. This is done by a group out in California. We just followed their methodology. Basically said, what does it take for EICUs to be cost effective? And in order to do that type of calculation, you have to put a dollar value on a quality adjusted life year, the same way you do for cancer chemotherapy or something like that. So the, the data suggest that the, the base cost effectiveness analysis estimated telemedicine in the ICU to extend 0.011 quality adjusted life years on a per patient basis with an incremental cost of $516, and that basically, the ratio comes out to about $45,000. That's about the threshold where people think treatments are worthwhile. Things that cost $100,000 per quality adjusted life year, you can't get them to pay for. Things that are down at $25,000 or $30,000, people are happy to write checks for. So it's kind of right on the cusp. It turns out the cost saving is also feasible if the per patient, per hospital stay operational costs and physician costs were less than 422 and 155 respectively. 422 and 155 adds up to 577 break even, even if there's no downstream benefit on quality adjusted life years. Currently, our costs are $643 per patient. We are continuing to recruit other hospitals. And in fact, if we just pick up 12 additional beds, because of the stepwise function of adding people to this enterprise, would bring our cost per patient down to about $500. So EICUs operate on the cusp of dollar value ignoring the quality pieces, the numbers say it's feasible depending on how well you manage the business. Next. I'm going to spend a lot of time walking through this, but, but it, it, this is worth reading. Here are the, how the cost savings work out. There's the 422, there's the 155 that I mentioned uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the previous statement. And again, this is a modeling process, but what you do is you get the idea is that a well-managed EICU can actually not only improve outcomes, but in a very meaningful way, reduce the immediate hospital costs, forget the data that we're talking about, total costs six months down, you know, 60 days or six months down range. So this is what we've learned. In some circumstances, EICU consistently saves lives. In some circumstances, EICU consistently saves costs. In some circumstances, EICU can enhance standard consistent practice. And maybe this is the most important thing, that last bullet. I want you to think about those moments in your ICU where things are coming unraveled. There's a new admission in bed two, bed four needs to be intubated, and bed seven has just arrested. Okay? All of a sudden, your local resources are stretched beyond the capacity to meet the patient needs. And when that happens, 
things get so stretched that the drip runs out in 10 and that patient doesn't do well without norepinephrine. What the EICU can do is change the division of labor, distribute the workload to people who are on site and who are remote, allow people who are on site to task shed and allow us to provide mutual support to manage through those times of crisis that happen in every ICU that I've ever worked in, and I imagine happen in yours periodically today. There are a bunch of things we don't know. These are still open questions. Where is the impact of the ICU least? Where is it greatest? Does it make more of a difference when physicians are at short supply, APPs, nurses are young, um, allied healthcare providers such as therapists or pharmacists are in short supply? Some of the hospitals we serve, you couldn't find a pharmacist there after 5 o'clock if somebody's life depended on it, but there are dose decisions to be made, drug selections to be made, interactions to be sorted through. We provide those services. Um, the patient complexity, you might think, that EICU is most effective in the high complexity patients in the community hospitals. Turns out that the greatest effectiveness in many of the studies turns out to be in the low complexity patients in the university hospitals because nobody's paying attention to them and nobody expects the wheels to come off that particular bus. We find it before anybody else does. Uh, local culture has a huge impact on EICU effectiveness. Cheryl will tell you about, well, we're not going to take the time. We don't have time for those no, stories. We don't. Um, uh, on, on how local culture and the EICU interact and reciprocally what we do for the local culture. And finally, we, there's not a lot of information. We're just beginning to get this on aggregate quality, safety, access, and financial performance. We know what happens in the ICU but there's not good understanding of how that projects through the hospital. And this model of remote care is actually starting to permeate outside the, the ICU into acute care environments in several hospitals nationwide. So next steps, we don't know. Uh, we, we continue to provide the services, the opportunities to reimagine critical care service delivery, uh, pretty much unlimited. Once you free yourself from the shackles of saying every caregiver has to be physically at the bedside and all the data have to be interpreted right next to the patient, the way we deliver critical care services can change. There's always going to be a need for a critical care nurse, clearly the best designed, best engineered safety device that, that has ever appeared in medicine. Uh, there's always going to be need, a need for a well-trained provider who can be at the bedside to evaluate and to perform procedures. Beyond that, remote care offers a huge amount of opportunity, and from our data, effective and at manageable cost. Thank you very much.